I'm just going to read uh, this verse one more time. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. If you follow the, the handout, uh, the sermon outline, it kind of gives you the overview of uh, what I'm about to share uh, with you uh, this morning. Now, perhaps this month uh, of February, before we start the new semester, that we can perhaps um, uh, focus on Psalm 1 and, and really work through uh, some of the details and the teaching and the message of this particular psalm, uh, especially in relation to uh, the topic of happiness. And that's really what, this, what today's message is all about, the search for happiness. Um, now, before I, we, you know, we dig into this topic, Psalm 1 uh, is a powerful psalm. Uh, it's, it's also a, um, a general introduction to the whole of the book of Psalms. It kind of um, gives you that kind of um, that entry uh, to which uh, the entire message of the psalm is unfolded. And this book, uh, this book of psalm has a definite view of life. It has a definite view of life. It has in, indeed a definite view of happiness. Now, if you look at the whole Bible, there is a whole vast amount of geography, there is a vast amount of geog uh, geology and a great deal of history over thousands of years through many various people and a great deal of information about leaders, a uh, great deal of information about wars, fighting, births, marriages, deaths, and endless details, endlessly. I mean, it's, it's a universe of its own, really. But the overall thrust of the message, the overall thrust and the pointing of the, of the Bible really leads and says one theme, one message. What is that? What is the overall message and theme of the Bible pointing to? And that is, we could say, that the Bible is about men and women in their relationship to God and what God has done for us and for our salvation. That's really what it all comes down to. That's, that's really what the entire Bible, um, you know, regardless of the nature of the details, regardless of uh, the historical context or the theological uh, context of its own day, that's really what is all pointing, that overall theme of God's relationship with his people and what he has done for our salvation. You see, happiness, that's really what defines the actions or decisions that we make, really, isn't it? I mean, it's so that we may be happy, right? But you see, happiness is one of the most, if not the most, uh, difficult concept in our human existence to define, right? You know, because the concept of happiness is what well, can be subjective and it can be relative and extremely elusive. I, I wonder what your understanding of happiness is. I want you to think for a moment, perhaps, what makes you happy? What makes you happy? In the light of that question, the psalmist's view of happiness has a definite approach. The psalmist's view of happiness has a definite approach and has a very distinct and unique definition from the way that we, as the world, understands and experiences happiness. And psalmist's uh, view of happiness, I say, is consistent. Uh, with other authors of the Bible. So if you understand how psalmist understands and defines happiness, see, that is consistent with other authors and the books of the Bible. And according to the psalmist, according to the Bible, we are to find true meaning of our life 
We are to find the true meaning of happiness in the context of God's salvation. In the context of God's salvation. And that's what the entire Bible is really pointing towards. Now, some may ask a question. The Bible, the book of Psalms in this case, has been written thousands of years ago in a place that is really quite foreign to us. The way that such an ancient and old book defines happiness and to apply that to our life, who live in this modern age, who live in, the, who live in this age of artificial intelligence and all these you know, uh, amazing technological advances, you know, isn't it a bit outdated to talk about happiness from such an old and ancient text as Psalms or, you know, indeed, the entirety of the Bible itself? You know, some people, even may even, uh, some people may even demand, can't you give us something up to date, you know, in talking about our happiness so that I may apply it uh, in my daily life. We live in this new world. We live in this scientific age rather than drawing our attention to such an ancient book why don't you try to look into the future and forecast what is going to happen now these questions i feel are fair questions you know legitimate questions and i would respond to such question with a verse from ecclesiastes chapter 1 Verse 9. Let's have a look at that together. Let's read that together, shall we? What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Now, this is the view that the Bible takes to evolving and to changing, ever-changing circumstances of our day. The Bible makes it, nails it down and says, what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Now, of course, our technolog uh, technology uh, may evolve and may change infinitely, you know, may, and of course it has, right? But the fundamental nature of humanity, right? The fundamental nature of humanity and its deprivation, and the only way to, to be saved from such deprivation hasn't changed, right? It hasn't changed. There is nothing new under the sun. Now, if somebody could demonstrate to me that the condition in which we find ourselves today in this world is essentially different, then I would think that there was something in the argument that indeed demands a new approach. But as we read from the scripture, you see, the condition of men and women in this world is what it has always been. Right? Notice what people were looking for, you know, in the time of the psalmist what were they looking for I mean what is the psalmist essentially talking about you know he's talking about blessing blessing so that we may be happy that's what blessing leads to right right blessings so that we may be content we may be happy right? we may lead a life that is full and abundant and as true and meaningful right the psalmist is is looking also for this blessing of God and happiness. I think the word uh, uh, blessed could also be interpreted as happy. And the psalmist explains what it means to be happy. And it's different. And it's unique from the way that the world understands the concept. And he explains, uh, you know, what... Uh, he explained, uh, he, he dis defines the term happiness and he explains to us what it means to lead a life that is truly blessed and that is truly happy. Happy is the man that does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Happy is the man that does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. The psalmist himself had been looking for happiness and so do the people today nothing really has changed i mean what is the point of everything that we do in life humanity has always been looking for happiness though not truly finding it it's an elusive concept it's an elusive 
experience. We think that we find happiness for, for one moment, but then again, it escapes our hands. It drifts away. It's, it's elusive. Sometimes happiness, as the world defines, is not really sustainable. It means that it doesn't really last as long as we think that it would. You know, the whole story of life, the whole history of humanity, the whole progress of um, civilization has been nothing but this great quest for happiness. But the reality of our world has always been since the fall, right? Since the fall of Adam, as it is now, a place of war, a place of fighting, a place of division, conflict, a place of envy, a place of malice and disappointment. Now, it may take different degrees of, of, of these things and different forms and shapes, but that does not change what it is in and of itself. I know that um, many philosophers have investigated this concept of happiness, what it means to be happy and how we can acquire such happiness in life. For example, I don't know whether you are familiar with a, a book by Thomas More called Utopia. Um, I don't know whether you have actually tried reading books on uh, philosophy. It's that I don't get it, you know, with their involved terminology. I mean, who can ever follow them, right? Right? We soon find that if there is anything that is utterly elusive uh, is, in this world, happiness. Well, you know, the ultimate stage with most people, indeed with all people, Unless they become Christians, unless they become Christians, is that they will probably fall into despair and into an utter sense of hopelessness and confusion. And I don't think I'm exaggerating here. You know, the so-called geniuses of our days, the so-called uh, the masterminds of our history, of our humanity, have searched for happiness and tried to articulate it and have ended in despair. Have ended in despair. For instance, Shakespeare's greatest plays are his tragedies. Do you notice? The greatest pieces of Greek literature that came out of Greece are Greek, sorry, uh, the, the, uh, the Greek stories that came out of um, uh, Greece, the literatures, are often Greek tragedies. You know, but others go beyond that, you know, in thinking that life is tragic. They become cynical. Right? And Shakespeare, again, has put into the mouth of uh, one of his characters, and this is the quote uh, from his literature. What is life? What a profound question, right? What is life? It's nothing but a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying absolutely nothing. I mean, that's a cynical view of life, isn't it? That's a very cynical view of life. Uh, uh, but you see, when you read the history of human race, you cannot help but feeling that there is something to that. I mean, you know, Shakespeare has put into his character, his mouth, the, the mouth of his character, such a cynical view towards life for a reason, you know? And that is the conclusion that the so-called geniuses of our days, of our history, have come to. That life is tragic. It's like a tale told by an idiot signifying absolutely nothing. I mean, that's what the, what the, what the so-called masterminds of our generation have concluded about life. The moment you get a thinker in this world, the moment you get a thinker in this world who is not a Christian, right? He will, he will come to one or the other of those cynical conclusions about life. Uh, it's almost given, isn't it? He either sinks down in despair or he sits in the corner in his cynicism and speaks thus about life. But thank God, thank God, here is a book that is simple, that is direct and plain, a book that reduces the complexity of humanity, humanity 
into just one big thing. So anybody can read it and understand it. You don't have to be an academic. Of course, there is a, a infinite a depth of the knowledge to be gained from it through studies, yeah, of course. But you see, even children can understand the message of the gospel, and that's the beauty of it. It speaks about life in such a plain and direct way that reduces the complexity of our life into just one big thing. Now, here in the Psalms, we have God's prescription. We have God's prescription for happiness. So we better listen up. Because it's not man's definition. It's not man's futile attempt of articulating and defining happiness. But it's God's unique way of teaching us what it means to be truly happy, to be truly blessed. Right? It is God's revelation. And that's what makes this book unique. That's what makes this book so very powerful. But let me add another reason for calling your attention to to the book, uh, to, to the Bible. Now, here's a teaching, right? The biblical teaching has stood the test of time for centuries from the very beginning. And that says a lot because usually when theories are introduced by scholars or by thinkers, you know, the better theory comes and it updates it and it replaces and removes the older theory, right? Uh, whether it's the teaching or, or a, a scientific discovery or, or even a philosophy. What was considered science 50 years ago is now laughed at, right? But you see, the teaching of the Bible has stood the test of time from the very beginning, and it hasn't changed. And that says a lot about the validity and the reliability of its teaching. The more you um, look at the Bible, right, you, you, you get the rich experience of individuals, you get the rich experience of the nations that are, that, that are timeless, that are true, right? And the more you look back and read history, the more you, you will find that there is indeed nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. The Bible says, yes, you're right, the life is tragic in a sense, right? But you have left out the most important factor in life. What is that? God. God. You cannot talk about happiness, let alone life, without God, without, you know, by leaving God out of equation. The Bible is unique and different from everything else in that it tells us here in Psalm 1, at the very outset, that we do not find happiness. Why? Because we seek it in the wrong way. We seek it without God. That's why you never arrive at happiness. If you start on the wrong road, it's only logical, isn't it? It's only natural that you end up at the wrong destination. Right? So let me tell you um, this morning some important negatives as you follow the uh, handout that's been given out with uh, the church bulletin about happiness according to the scripture. First, the first negative is this, is that happiness does not depend ultimately upon circumstances. Right? The kind of happiness, the kind of joy, the kind of peace that the Bible articulates and teaches us is certainly not based upon our circumstances or based upon people around us. See, when we think of happiness in a worldly sense, we think that we'll be happy when our pockets are full of money. And that's how we understand happiness, right? Many of us, right? Very, very common. We think that we will be happy when we get nice things, luxurious things, you know, things that are rare, things that are highly sought after, right? And we pay a premium for it. And we think that we will be happy when we get promoted in workplace, right? We think that we'll be happy when we move into a big, tidy house. And you know, some Christians, or some Christian leaders even, have understood blessing and happiness in this way. Of course, the Bible does not preclude the necessity of these material things, right, that enriches life. 
but it does not define happiness on this foundation. It does not define happiness on these material things of life, but it does not preclude the necessity of it either. Right? So material things in life are important to different degrees, but the kind of happiness which the Bible teaches does not ultimately depend on these things or circumstances. Let me say once more, the kind of happiness that is sustainable, that is eternal, which is what the Bible is really promoting here, right? does not ultimately depend on these things or circumstances. Things that are not eternal, things that are destined to pass away and disintegrate, cannot bring us joy, true joy and peace and happiness. Just cannot. Right? And that, that really is the fundamental truth of life, isn't it? Things that are not eternal cannot bring us true joy and happiness. This is the fundamental truth of life. You, you, you want a nice thing. Say you want a, a nice wristwatch, right? And you acquire it after saving money. And then all of a sudden, the joy kind of passes away after maybe a few years. And then you want a new watch, new things, right? Or more watches, more things to make you happy. Right? I, 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 I'm sure we've all been there to different degrees, right? The moment you think that your life will be happy when you acquire certain things, sooner or later, you discover that it's never enough. It's never enough, right? There's no end to our greed, is there? Right? And yet, we constantly fool ourselves. We constantly fool ourselves into believing that if we get just more things, more things, then we'll be happy. But happiness is never really there. Happiness is never really there. So let's move on to our second negative th th uh, this morning. The second negative is that happiness is a byproduct of something infinitely greater. Right? Happiness is a byproduct of something infinitely greater. It says that blessed is the man that seeks after happiness. No, it doesn't say that, does it? It doesn't say that the blessed is the man that seeks after blessing. It doesn't say that. No. Blessed is the man that does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Right? Wicked in other versions have been translated as ungodly. Right? So blessed is the man that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, but his delight in, is in the law of the Lord. His joy and happiness is in the word of God. Right? And because of that joy, he meditates on it day and night. Right? 24-7. At all times. So Psalmist's first priority, interestingly, is not in the pursuit of happiness. It's in something greater. Infinitely greater. Now let me give you a New Testament uh, teaching on this. Our Lord Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Let's have a look at that. Right? And it's the same kind of um, pattern of teaching. Let's read that together, shall we? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for happiness and blessing. No. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Right? For they will be satisfied. For they will be filled. Right? Let's have a look at also uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 to 33. Now, these are some of the most common uh, worries that we have, right? Do not worry. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? You know, all these things are the most common uh, things that we worry about, right? And that we, we, we base our life upon. Again, the Bible does not preclude the necessity of these material things. The following verse says, right, God knows, the Heavenly Father knows that you need them. We need them, right? But in verse 33, but in verse 33, what are we to first seek is consistent with the previous verses. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well, right? 
The primary focus of Christian life is therefore not in chasing after happiness. The primary focus of Christian life is therefore not in chasing after happiness. The Bible never makes happiness an end in and of itself. It's always a byproduct of pursuing something infinitely greater, right? The kingdom of God, His righteousness, and happiness that we need in life is a byproduct of, of that, right? So in the same way, Psalmist defines happiness only in the context of God's salvation, right? For His people. Let's move on to our third point. No one will find happiness until he has finally turned away from evil and has committed himself to God. No one will find true happiness until he has turned away from his evil ways and has committed himself to God. Now, the Psalm 1 teaches us to avoid certain things, like a plague, right? And it teaches us to avoid, first of all, first and foremost, the counsel of the wicked, the counsel of the ungodly, right? Uh, this means that if you want to be truly happy, right, the psalmist says you must avoid certain things in life like a plague, and the first thing that you must do is to stop listening to the whole outlook of the world at the present time. Now, what the psalmist means by, th by that is this. is the world that is without God, the world that is intentionally opposed to God, the world that, is, uh, uh, that intentionally does not recognize Him. Right? That's why the world is in the state that it is in today. Why? Because the, the, the world without God, you see, cannot offer joy that is everlasting. Right? Now, Psalm uh, chapter 10, verse 4, describes the evil man as follows. Let's have a look at that. Shall we read that together? In his pride, the wicked man does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. There is no room for God. Isn't this a remarkably accurate description of today's view, today's worldview, right? In a so-called evil man, in a so-called evil world that the psalmist uh, depicts, right, is full of pride, full of pride. Right? And because of this pride, that, that kind of world does not seek God. And in all its thoughts, there is no room for God. Right? And Bible defines such world, such man, evil. And if you want to be happy, you must avoid such evil world or evil man. And you must stop listening to such evil world. Don't waste your time. The, 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 the evil world, um, evil man will say, don't waste your time going to church. The evil man will say, don't waste your time reading that outdated ancient book called the Bible. Right? Science has now replaced it. There are so many books like that these days that, that young people are falling into. Well, not, not just young people, I guess. You know? And, and the evil man will say that the Bible is out of date, and science has now replaced it, and it has shown that it's full of nonsense. Don't listen to it. Don't believe in God. Believe in yourself. Now, that is the counsel of the wicked. That is the counsel of the ungodly. And there is no true happiness, Bible says. Don't be fooled by it. Don't be deceived by it. There is no truth in such ungodliness. Without the truth, of course, no happiness. There is no true happiness in ungodliness. Now, let's move on to our fourth point. Another thing that um, the psalmist tells us to avoid is this. Do not stand in the way of sinners. If you want to be happy, you must avoid the way of the world, the way of the sinner. The way of the sinner is to live to satisfy his flesh. The way of the sinner is to live to satisfy his flesh, is to really satisfy his instinct. Right? He lives to eat. 
right? And he lives to drink. He lives to indulge in pleasures, sexual pleasures. And he becomes chained by it, becomes addicted to these things. And the psalmist says, you will never find happiness that way. Nobody ever has. Don't be fooled by it. Don't be deceived by it. Let's move on to our fifth point. And the psalmist also says, do not sit in the seat of mockers. Now, who are these people, do you think? Mockers, scoffers, people who scorn at things. You know? Who are these people? Now, they are the people who stick out their tongues at everything that is sacred and holy. Right? Now, these are the very clever people, the witty people who laugh at Christianity and joke at it. People who mock God. People who mock God, His law, His ordinances, His practice, His teaching. People who mock all the sanctities of life, right? such as marriage, morality, decency, and call it freedom and self-expression. That's not freedom. It's not true freedom. There's only bondage in, people, in people's life like that. People who scoff, people who scorn at the sanctities of life. People who laugh at the godly things of life, right? There is no happiness there. There is no freedom there. There is no truth there. In fact, it has nothing to offer, nothing valuable, nothing that means anything. These empty people think that they are so witty and so clever and that they are above everything. And these mockers are, Bible says, are about as far removed from godliness and happiness as anyone can be. God says, do not listen to these scoffers. Do not listen to these people who scorn the Bible. Do not listen and be swayed by these people who laugh at Christianity and say it's, it's outdated and that you are following something that is replaced by something else. Do not waste your time following them because they have no hope at all. In fact, they have nothing to offer. There is no happiness there. There is no joy. There is no peace there. Now finally, uh, as a conclusion of today's message, here is the secret of happiness. Here is the secret of happiness. It is that his delight, his joy, his happiness, right, is in the law of the Lord. It's in the word of God. And this is God's prescription for happiness. Right? This is not man's understanding or definition of happiness, but it's God's unique revelation to us as to saying, if you want to be happy, if you want the true joy to fill your life, you must delight in my law, in my ordinances, in my words, and meditate on it day and night. This is God's way of happiness. This is God's teaching of true happiness that lasts, that is sustainable. They meditate on it day and night and say that there is nothing quite like it. Let me ask you this morning. Do you delight in the word of God? Amen? Do you delight in Christ Jesus? Do you delight in meditating on it day and night? Do you delight meditating upon the joys and the glories of eternity? Do you delight in the fact that we are Christians, that we can approach our God at will, freely, right? Do you delight in that privilege? Do you delight in that joy? If you do, right, it does not matter what the world does to you because your happiness is independent of those circumstances. You will continue to be blessed no matter what, right? Despite the persecutions, you will continue to be happy despite people mocking you perhaps see the, the kind of happiness the kind of joy that the bible is teaching us is independent of these circumstances nothing else and nobody can take away this joy from you it's solid does not sway it's firm right for all is settled between you and god and this reconciliation right this reconciliation transcends our circumstances it's not limited by it. It's not bound by it. 
So how can we get this blessing if you do not yet have it? How can we acquire such blessing if you yet do not have it? Well, we cannot force ourselves to becoming righteous, right? We cannot make ourselves righteous. It's not as, it's not as easy as it sounds, is it? Right? And uh, see, you will soon find that our will, our so-called willpower is too weak. Right? And the Bible knows that all too well. The Bible knows that all too well. There is only one way to get this blessedness. Right? Is to come to the Bible in obedience. You see, what did John the Baptist say? Right? As a forerunner to Christ. Repent and believe the gospel. It's that simple, isn't it? And it's been, uh, 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 that message has been picked up and preached by our Lord himself. Repent and believe the gospel. So simple and yet so powerful, isn't it? Right? And that's really what we are left to do. To come to the Bible in repentance, in obedience, right? And God promises us that it will meet you and give you the gift and the joy of salvation. The joy of salvation from, from which true happiness is experienced for God's children. Isn't this what the entire Bible is really pointing to? Right? Uh, let's have a look at John 3.16. Let's leave that together. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. What a joy and happiness that is given to people who come to his Son in obedience and believe him. For these people, they will never perish, but have eternal life. See? And that eternal life it's something that gives us a joy and happiness that is sustainable, that lasts, that is true, and that means something. It's not the kind of happiness that the world offers that is ephemeral, right? That is destined to pass away rather quickly than we all think, right? Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Let's read that together. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And this is the most wonderful and the most powerful promise from God himself. For those who come and believe him, right, shall have new life in Christ. Shall have new purpose in Christ. Shall have new vision, new motivation in life. Right? Because of his son, Christ Jesus. Folks, this is the source of our true happiness. Right? This is the source of true happiness. New life in Christ. Amen? New life in Christ. New purpose in Christ. New vision in Christ. Now He is the motivation of my life that drives me, that promotes me, that sustains me, that enables me to persevere sufferings in life and the problems of life because of this new life that is in me. Through Christ Jesus. That is the source of happiness that is not swayed by the temptations, that is not swayed by the world's attack, by the, by the enemy's deceptions, but that new life, that new hope in Christ is sustainable, is firm, it's solid, it's unswayable, and it's unbreakable. It's unbreakable. And that's the only way to true happiness, the Bible says. It's true happiness. Forsake the thought. Forsake the thought and practice of the ungodly. Do not be pressured to conform to the ways of the world. Believe the message of God in Christ. Receive it into your heart in repentance, in obedience, and in humility. Give yourself to Him and ask Him to fill you with this new life that alone can make you blessed. That alone can keep you blessed, whatever may happen to you in this world of time. Let us pray. Mm. If I may ask the EPT to join us. At this time, let us give thanks to God for His Son, Jesus Christ. 
and the gift of new life in him. Let's spend a few moments giving him praise and honor. Let's make that our prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Let us also ask God to help us to turn from our evil, ungodly ways and commit ourselves to Him. Let's ask God's help and anointing in that endeavor. Let's also ask God's help so that we may be able to redirect our attention, our focus of life upon God's righteousness, upon the kingdom of God. Let's ask for God's help in that endeavor. Let's make that our prayer this morning. us confess our weakness and our unbelief that so often steal our joy and peace let us ask God that he will give us faith to come to him trusting that he knows what we need let's make that our prayer Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, Christ Jesus, and the gift of new life. And Lord, we ask that you will help us to turn from our ungodly ways and commit ourselves wholeheartedly to you and to your righteousness and to your kingdom, O oh Lord. And as we confess our weakness and our unbelief that so often steal our joy and peace and happiness, we ask that you will give us this unwavering faith upon each one of us here this morning to come to you, trusting you, that you know what's best for us and you know what we need, O oh Lord. So Lord, we thank you for the assurance of salvation. We thank you for the gift of joy through your Son, Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.